Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we're going to get into this study, Are You Looking Proving Your Own Selves Wisdom? But before we get into this study, I got a, I have a package. Uh, I just want to remind the brethren again, you want Bibles, I'll get you Bibles. Okay, especially overseas. Uh, in the States, a lot of the brethren don't have problems getting Bibles because you can get a Bible, King James Bible, King James Bible, God's perfect written word. I got this, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, but uh, um, Lately, I've been sending Bibles overseas to countries where the, the local Bible church publishers aren't sending. Right now, they're only sending to um, America and Canada and the Bible publishers here in America. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ that are overseas, if it's within my budget, if God blesses me, and He has, uh, to be able to send Bibles, you know, email this ministry. Okay, uh, I got the two different Bible church publishers. Um, I'll make sure that they're... Um, how do you say it? Under the subscriptions, under my page, YouTube page. I'll, pro I'll try to remember. If I forget, I forget. You can remind me, Brothers of Christ, to put... There's two different websites that you can get King James Bibles from. They're, they're local church Bible publishers. And you can look through there, and if you want to get a good Bible and everything, and you can't get it where you're at, or you can't afford a nice Bible, you have an old Bible like this we're talking about that's old, it's falling apart, um, and you can't afford a nice Bible like this, uh, lambskin, calf skin. Uh, you can't afford something like this, but you, you love the Lord, you love His perfect written word, the King James Bible, you're applying it to your life, you want a nice Bible, hit up this ministry, brothers of Christ, because I do do that. I mail Bibles to people. <laughs> what, the easiest way, though, is they mail it to me. When I order the Bible, they mail it to me, so it's already packaged, so then I re-tape everything up, and I remail it to the brethren that need the Bibles. And it's a fast and easy way to do it. It, it works really great. Um, I, went, I did my, I did my uh, monthly trip to Gold Beach to the used bookstore, and I didn't find anything. I remember when I told you guys about this book, I got it from, from uh, the used buy, the bookstore where it looks like gold. If you look straight on, it looks like gold. But if you fan it out, it looks red. And this is my favorite Bible. It really is. The print's good. It's old. It still has that old... I like the smell of old Bibles. Uh, old books. Period. But old books. The paper and everything. But this is just the Word of God. There's no commentary. This is what I feel it should be and everything. You know, it's just the Word of God. It's you, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. And I love this Bible. I use it. Uh, when I do my um, reading of the Old Testament, where I listen to Alexander Scorvey and I follow along, the problem that I, the only problem I have with this Bible is the tabs. I'm still, when it comes to the Old Testament, I'm still flipping around trying to find stuff in the Old Testament because I don't have it quite memorized. Um, so that's why in our Bible studies, for the most part, if it's a short Bible study, I'll still use this one. I'll use this one every time if we're just going through three or four verses and it's going to be a quick 10 minute to 30 minute Bible study. I'll use that. But I like this because it's got the tabs. <laughs> That's why. And it's got my notes. So when we're reading sometimes, if we turn to the scriptures, depending on how in-depth of a study we do, you can turn to them. I hope you are. You pause the video, and in this study we're going to be doing, you can turn, turn to the, the verses that we're going to do. But since we're going to be hitting a lot of verses, I'll be turning to one or two, and then we're going to go through a lot of parallel verses just talking with you. Okay? Uh, but then I found this in my recent trip. And it's red, King James Bible. It's got that you it's got that old paper book smell. Very small writing, but it's still it's, it's, it's still a good Bible. Uh, Margaret Mello had this book. And Haiti M. Gray, it looks like. Dre Gray, because it's it's in cursive. Um, This is a good Bible, okay? I, the reason I collect Bibles is there might come a day where I can't order any more Bibles. I mean, I think this was several years ago. I mean, several, several years ago. Uh, there was a time where they tried to pass a law in California where King James Bibles couldn't be sold in California. It was like snuck into a law trying to hide it. And, of course, the law didn't pass, but the fact that they're trying to do it, uh, in Israel right now, they're trying to sneak, sneak law in where the name Jesus isn't allowed to be met, preached, talked about, or mentioned in Jerusalem and in, in Israel. 
um, they're trying to pass the law. So they could pass a law at any time saying we can't order any, you can't, the, they will shut down the local Bible church publishers, and you can't order or buy any brand new Bibles. It's good to have a, a, an arsenal of King James Bibles to give out when we go through the hard times. So I wanted to mention that. And the other thing is I wanted to ask the brethren, I've been collecting these in case I lose the internet. I, you know me, I'm always planning a little bit ahead. Uh, if I lose the internet uh, before God catches us up, I've been collecting a lot of things on hard drives, downloading videos on hard drives, having the Bible studies on hard drives from brethren. And Peter Ruckman, I've been buying his uh, chalk talks. So, you know, I'm doing my hardcore studies lately, and I want to listen to a testimony, a good testimony, where Peter Ruckman's still using scripture a little bit, and then he's given testimonies on it, and his life application, that man has been through a lot. So I've been buying these, and my question to the brethren that have been buying these also, have you been having the problems I've been having? And this is like the only, these are two, but I've had four to five of these, I think four, four or five, where they don't work. I order them, and they don't work. Uh, there's a glitch in how they're putting it. Instead of them putting them all together in one 30-minute segment or one hour-long segment, um, they break it up into 15-minute segments. And I can go into the folder. If, if those who know about computers, there's a folder. You can go into the DVD, go into the folder, and you can look and say, okay, here's five parts to the study that when you play it through the DVD, it'll play all five parts together as if they're one. But if one of those parts don't work, you get 20 minutes into the study, it stops working. Uh, sometimes it, wouldn't, it won't even start. Sometimes you get to the last 20 minutes and that last video clip is corrupted and it just the whole DVD shuts down and stops. Error, error. And it's like, no, I was really getting into that study. So I just don't know. Uh, just to hear from the brother. Are you guys having some problems with this? Uh, I have I've been trying. To, I'm going to get with them and talk with them. When just a couple, I understand mistakes happen. Just a couple, but lately it's been happening a lot. And it's like, Ugh. so I don't know if it's happening with you guys. So I'll get with them and talk with them about that. Um, but brother and Christ, sister in Christ, it's good to collect these. I love Peter Ruckman. I know he's got his faults. He's got his problems. Uh, and I'll say this real quick because we're going to get into the study. His number one problem. He, his number one problem, he loved the Lord. They always do that sarcastically. It's that he loved the Lord. Yes, he did. He loved the Lord and he loved his word. But his fault, the Bible talks about confessing your faults. His number one fault was he had a problem pushing the word of God first over, hear what I'm saying, over church fathers. Okay? Over church fathers. So when you're watching this, be careful. There's some things that he promotes that the church fathers promoted but they're not in Scripture. Building a building, calling a building a church, inviting both saved and lost to it. That's church fathers that got it from the Reformation, that got it from Catholicism. The, the Trinity terms come from, Catholic, uh, from the church fathers that got it from the Reformation, that got it from Catholicism. Reformation is they, can't, they wanted to reform Catholicism. They didn't want to do away with it. We're coming out. We got God's Word. Everything you guys told us, Catholicism, Catholic Church, is a lie. We're coming out. We got the Word of God now. We're just going to follow the Word of God. That wasn't it. The Reformation is we're coming out and we're going to reform Catholicism and try to save what we can when it's all, when it's all corrupt. But we're going to try to save what we can. No, you need to just get the King James Bible and follow the King James Bible. Peter Ruckman pushed, the, uh, the, he used Trinity terms, but he taught the Godhead of the King James Bible. But he couldn't let go of the Trinity terms. He couldn't let go of terms that aren't in the Bible, like rapture, like millennial kingdom. They're, that's not in the Bible. It's the day of the Lord. It's not rapture. It's caught up. It's not millennial kingdom. It's um, the day of the Lord is the biggest one to help define a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. The day of the Lord... Okay, the day of the Lord is, the, is what that thousand year time period is called where Jesus is going to come back and rule and reign. It's the day of the Lord, it's the kingdom of heaven, and sometimes it's referred to as the kingdom of God. Those are the three titles because the kingdom of God can be the spiritual kingdom or the physical kingdom. Okay, you've got to rightly divide, 2 Timothy 2.15. But those are the three proper titles. He had a hard time letting go of titles. He did. Okay, he has his faults. I'm not going to stand here and exonerate his thought, his faults, 
and uplift his faults. I'm going to tell you where his faults are. And when I have my faults, you tell me right plain to my face where my faults are. Okay? Through the scriptures. But make sure you're doing it through the scriptures. And remember, in meekness, in meekness, instructing those that oppose himself. Peter Ruckman's in heaven right now. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that because of this right here. Peter Ruckman is in heaven right now. He knows better. Okay. So that being said, he still has a lot of amazing studies. And I still collect his studies. There's some of his chalk talk studies I'm like, eh, I don't quite agree with you. And there's some that I do. But I'm not saying we can agree to disagree, but I'm saying we need to start collecting, if you want, collecting. You know, I got a hard drive here that I've got King James Video Ministries before Brian Denlinger fell. I got uh, um, some ex-Catholics for Christ, but not many. Uh, I have my problems with them. Uh, because they don't line up with the Bible, we're, we're going to get into this study. Where's the fear of God? Where's the love of God? Okay? When they start pushing things, that anybody starts pushing something that's not in the Scriptures and doesn't line up with the Scriptures and you're not rightly dividing, where's the fear of God? Where's the love of God? That's the test. Okay? But I've got uh, Sam Gipp. I've, but I, I, there's things I disagree with that man because he doesn't line up with the Bible. Okay? Um, David Daniels. Okay, there's some things that he taught me. Okay, um, King James. I think I said Brian Denlinger, King James Video Ministries, before he he became born again barbarian and he turned his back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He started perverting the Word of God to justify sin and worldliness and sin wickedness. Uh, he started turning his back on people that kick his sin, his lowercase g gods. I'm sorry, but that's just the truth of the matter. When there's a disagreement, he doesn't follow the Bible and do and, and handle the disagreement the Bible way. He does it the world's way. And on and on and on. But there was a time where he did do it God's way. We don't just throw those good Bible studies out, brothers and sisters Christ. We keep them. Collect them. Keep them. Keep the good Bible studies. Keep the truth. Because there might come a day where you can't get on the internet. Right? There might come a day when you're not. So I'm sorry for this too big of an intro before we get into the study, but I just wanted to mention those things. I can get you Bibles. Make sure you're keeping your eyes open for Bibles. Make sure you're collecting good Bible studies. Good Bible studies that line up with the Scriptures. And when someone starts falling away, don't just throw everything out. Because we're going to be talking the study. When we go through the study real quick, there's two types of people that I'm going to be mentioning. False converts. Because remember, prove your own selves. Examine whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. We're going to be talking about false converts, and we're going to be talking about brethren that are part of the falling away, and you have to use spiritual discernment to discern between the two. Okay? There are some brethren that say if you're part of the falling away, you're automatically lost. That's not true. The falling away is for people who are saved, that are in a standing point. You can't lose your salvation. So that's why they just say you were lost to begin with. Because they don't want to say you lost your salvation because they believe in eternal security, which is a good thing. Because the eternal security is truth. But in order to fall, you have to be in a standing position to begin with. You can't fall if you're already fallen. The lost world's already fallen. They're already in a lost state. You can't be part of the falling away unless you were in a standing position to begin with. Okay? So when we go through these studies, okay, you've got saved, I mean false converts, Wolves in sheep's clothing, the Bible says false brethren, ministers of Satan, okay? And then you've got people that are becoming part of the falling away. The flesh is getting in the way, the world's getting in the way, Satan and his ministers are whispering in their ear and drawing them away from doing things God's way, fearing God, loving God's word, doing things God's way, okay? So keep that in mind as we go through these series of studies. Okay, there's two types of people we'll be talking about, and I'm going to do my best not to, you know, kind of mix them a little bit, because sometimes it's hard. You can have brethren that look like they're lost, act like they're lost, but how do you tell that they're brethren? At one point, they were in a standing position. They were so different than the lost world. There was a changed life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. They, they, you saw the change in their life. There was a change. They were a man of God. They loved God. They loved His Word. They were fighting for Him. But something happened over time that now they're starting to look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, do things the world's way, give in to the flesh, try to justify sin, wickedness. Their priorities are all messed up, and I can keep going on and on and on. And if all you did was see them in that fallen state, you would say they're lost. 
And I uh, treat them like to preach the gospel to them. You treat both the same, I believe. False convert, someone who is in a fallen state. You preach the gospel to them. You go back to the beginning. You preach the fear of God and you preach the love of God. You go back to the beginning. But we need to understand there's a difference because I don't believe you can lose your salvation. There's a difference between someone who's a fake and a fraud and someone who's in a fallen state. Okay, so remember that as we're going through this study. Turn to 2 Corinthians 13.5. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Let's get into what the actual Word of God says. Not this man's feelings. It's not that I'm talking feelings, but not this man's words. But let's get into the Word of God. So make sure you get the King James Bible out. And like I said, you can pause the video and turn. We're going to turn to some of these. Uh, and then I'm going to use parallel passages and mention parallel passages, and you can pause and turn to each parallel passage. And that's what I used to do when I'd follow a brother, and that's what I do when I follow any brother that's preaching. I'll pause the video and turn to every scripture because it helps me learn where everything is in the Bible. And it also helps me when I read and follow along, it helps me to memorize scripture. Then I try to apply it to my life, which is this is where the scripture needs to end up. It starts with seeing the scriptures, hearing the scriptures and speak in the scriptures to get it up here, and then it's got to make its way down here to living the scriptures. And that's the, that's, to me, that's the best way. Right? That's just my, my advice as a brother in Christ, from someone who has a hard time remembering things. I had a major seizure disorder for nine to ten years. Okay, I, Unless I did something repeatedly, like I could tell you movies like that, because I watched Hollywood movies and TV shows left and right, I could watch them in my head without even hitting the play button, because I had watched them a million times. And the video games, okay, and some of the other bad stuff that I was into. And then the point is, is God's taught me that use that repetition in a good way. If you want good things in your head, you want good things in your heart, it's going to take time. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A workman. What's a workman? It's not a craftsman. Okay? I had a brother in Christ try to change the word of God because, he, oh God, you got it wrong. It's not workman, it's craftsman. No. Those are two things. A workman can develop into a craftsman and be a craftsman someday. But all workman means is that you labor. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes repetition. How many, like I said, you get through this book once, you're good and you're done. No, you're not. Read it again. Oh, I just went through it a second time. Do it a third time. I've done it a hundred times. Do it a hundred times more. Oh, I've been through it a thousand. I've done it. It's repetition. You've got to keep going in. You've got to keep staying in this and getting this and here and in here. Because the world tries to get other junk in here and here and push the good stuff out. And those of you brothers and Christ understand what I'm talking about. I used to have that verse memorized. What happened? Well, I haven't really read the Bible in a while because I got distracted by the world and the flesh and Satan and his ministers. You see? Well, I used to have that memorized. I used to know where this was. I remember that story, but I can't remember that. Why? Because you don't keep it fresh in your heart and in your head. It takes repetition. So pause the video and turn to them, okay? Pause the video and turn. So 2 Corinthians 13, 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we read, Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. The whole point of this study, examine yourselves. That's what you do, brother, says Christ. And these studies are, the whole point of these studies is to help you examine yourselves. Okay, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. That's what you're supposed to do. This second part is the part that the world hates. The easy believism, the false gospel of easy believism. Faith alone, faith alone. When you ask them to prove that they're saved, they get all flippant. And they just get mad, they get angry, they get bitter, they get hateful, they get vengeance. I see it in the comment sections all the time. You're lost. You're just going. You're teaching a false gospel. You're on your way to hell. But they don't dare preach me the gospel. Their version of the gospel. They don't want to see people get saved because they're not saved. It's not, like I said right here, prove your own selves. We're supposed to, after salvation, after you're saved, you're now supposed to be in Christ Jesus. You're supposed to be a light into this world. You're supposed to be separate from this world. You're supposed to prove yourself. Your life, your faith, the life that you live, sanctification, is supposed to prove that you belong to Jesus Christ. 
And when you ask a brother or sister in Christ to prove that they're a brother or sister in Christ, to prove that they're saved, it doesn't go well with a lot of these worldly false converts. It doesn't go well at all. They flip out. Yet the Bible says, prove your own selves. Why? Because this is the Corinthians. This is at the very end of the second Corinthians after he's gone through and, and he's preaching the gospel to saved people. He's preaching the gospel to them. If a man be called a brother, if any man be in Christ, examine yourselves where you be at. Why? He's telling them you need to keep proving yourself to make sure why. Not that you're not saved, once you get saved, to prove that you don't become part of the falling away. That's why I need to prove myself every day. To God, to you brothers and sisters in Christ, being a light to the world, to the lost world. Being a light for Jesus Christ. We need to prove ourselves every day. Why? Because we don't want to become part of the falling away. Prove your own selves. Know ye you not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates? Oh no, it's just verbal. It's just verbal. It's just verbal. Where's the deeds to back it up? Words and deed. No, no, if they say they're a Christian, they're a Christian. If they say they're a part of the church of the living God, then they're part of the church of the living God. If they say that they're a brother or sister in Christ, they're a brother and sister in Christ. If they say they're a Bible believer, then they're a Bible believer. No. That doesn't mean that they're all those things. Prove it. If you say you're that, prove it. And that's the hard thing today, brothers and Christ. That's what causes so much conflict because we got so many wolves in sheep's clothing, snakes in the roaring their way into the body of Christ that they're trying to push this, we don't judge anybody and we don't have to prove that we're saved or anything. We don't have to prove anything to anybody. Who are you to judge me? Why? Because they don't want to get singled out and proven to be false. In here, servants of Satan whispering in your ear. Sometimes you have brethren that get into a fallen state and they don't want to get back up. And you have to struggle with them. Prove yourselves. Right now you're setting a bad example for Jesus Christ. Prove yourself. Are you in a standing position or a falling position? Prove yourself. Oh, I'm standing. Prove it. Why do people hate that? They, they should love that. I need to prove myself, Lord. If I fail you, I need to repent. I need to forsake. And I need to get back to walking with you. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 Corinthians, the very first chapter. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. How do you prove yourself? How do you examine yourself? Now, Ephesians 5 is a great book for examining the changed life. It's a great chapter, book and chapter in the Bible. The King James Bible. Okay? But I would say 30, but let's go back to 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Man's wisdom. The world's way. Man's way. World's way. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Those who are saved following God's way. And God's word. God's the authority. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, why? To bring to naught the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know when you have a brother in Christ that I believe is saved and they're in a fallen state, you know why they're in that fallen state? They're glorifying their flesh in God's presence. The world's way, Satan's way, the flesh's way is what you're glorifying. And, and, and that's why you're in that fallen state. Because if you were glorifying God, you wouldn't be in that fallen state. It all becomes about me, myself, and I. But here's the verse that we're going to use. Verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. When you're talking about examining whether you be in the faith, are you in Christ Jesus? When we say prove that you're, you're, um, that you're in Christ Jesus, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Here's the Bible definition. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who God hath made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Those are the four things that you test yourself every day. Am I following God? Do I fear God? We're going to get into this. Do I fear God for wisdom? That's the one we're going to start with. Do I fear God? Do I love God? Well, the reason I threw love in there with that is you're going to find out that the fear of God and the love of God have the same fruits. They're two things. And you need to have both, but they have the same fruits. Mm -hmm. 
But righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So a lost person doesn't glory in the Lord, a saved person does glory in the Lord. And how does a saved person glory in the Lord? Because, God, because they're in Christ Jesus, and they're made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And we're going to break these things up and talk about them one by one. We're going to start with wisdom. God has made unto us wisdom. And a lot of you know, where do we start with wisdom? How do we start? What's the beginning of wisdom? How many of you brothers and sisters of Christ know where I'm going with this? What's the beginning of wisdom in the Bible? Turn to Job 28. Turn to Job 28. Job. The oldest book in the Bible, Job 28. Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. This is where we get the that is wisdom. Sorry, that is wisdom. Uh, when we get to Psalms 110, 11, 10, that's the beginning of wisdom. But that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. The fear of the Lord. What you're going to see here, brothers and sisters Christ, is fear of the Lord leads to obeying God's commands and getting wickedness and sin out of your life. That's true fear of the Lord. Now, God gives you the power through the Holy Spirit after salvation to clean up your life. But fearing God is keeping His commandments. And when you realize you haven't kept His commandments, that's where the fear of God comes in. Because people always try to throw in your face, are we supposed to be scared all the time and just in dread? And these last days, and the temptation, and how the brethren are falling away, dropping like flies, uh, yeah, we need to be fearful every day. We need to look in that mirror. I have a few mirrors in the house. You need to look in the mirror and look at yourself and say, hey, am I fearing God today? Or am I being distracted by the flesh? Distracted by the world? Distracted by Satan and his ministers? The Bible talks about how his, he transforms himself into an angel of light and no marvel that his ministers are also transformed into the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Satan himself is, is a cherub and he's one, um, I almost want to say, one creation. He's going around, he can't whisper in everybody's ear at the same time, he's not God. But he's got evil spirits, demons, he's got ministers, men that serve him that go around and whisper in people's ears. And you get distracted. You need to be looking in the mirror every day and saying, Lord, do I fear you? When I make my decisions and how I live my life and how I talk, the stance that I take when it comes to the faith, is it first, first based on fearing you and wanting to please you? Okay? And fearing not pleasing God. Fearing not being a servant of God. Uh, Psalms 111.10, Psalms 111.10, another parallel verse about how the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and it's the beginning of wisdom. The fear, Psalms 111.10, we read, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God has made unto us wisdom. Where does wisdom start? Fearing God. Before I got saved, I had to have a fear of God. How, let me know, brothers and Christ, how often do you hear that preached when it comes to the gospel? Where's the fear of God? You've sinned against an almighty, righteous God that's going to judge you someday and send you to a hell which, and then to the lake of fire where you're going to burn for all eternity. Eternal torment and suffering where there will be gnashing of teeth. Where's the fear? Today, we're, they're just taught, love, God is love, and God, present tense, loves you in your lost state, and God loves you, and all you have to do is believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, and, 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 and you don't even have to say a prayer anymore. Before, it was just say a little prayer, and now you don't even have to say a prayer anymore, and, and you're in and everything. Where's the fear of God? We're seeing a lot of false converts out there, brothers and sisters Christ, that don't fear God. We see brethren in fallen states that over time they've talked themselves out of conviction. 
They've talked themselves out of fearing God, and now they're in a fallen state. If they fe truly feared God, they wouldn't be in that fallen state. And I speak from experience. I can point the finger at everybody. You know, I talked about the brethren that I have problems with lately because they're becoming part of the falling away. I can point the finger at everybody else, but the number one person I need to be pointing the finger at is me. I have been part of the falling away. I have failed to fear the Lord sometimes, and God has to bring me back. Repentance. You have to come back to the first step. What's the first step? Fearing God. What's the true test of someone, whether they're, they're a false convert or they're a part of the falling away? Remember, they're falling away. It's because you once saw them in a standing point. They've proved themselves to be in a standing point, the, ch the new creature in Christ Jesus, the changed life. They belong to God, but now you see them falling away. That's called falling away. They're not lost. They're part of the falling away. But whether they're a false convert or part of the falling away, the test is, where's the fear of God? That is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Do his commandments. Look at the three parts here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And by default, if you fear God, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. If you fear God, you're going to do his commandments. And in retrospect, his praise endureth forever. What did we just read in 1 Corinthians 1.30? According as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. What leads to us glorifying God and praising God when we fear him and keep his commandments? What's the number one commandment? I'm getting ahead of myself, but what's the number one commandment today? Obey the gospel. Get saved. Let God save you. Come to him on his terms and let God save you. Obey the gospel. That's where true praise from God comes from. That's how we're able to truly praise God, because we fear Him, and we're doing our best to keep His commandments. And when we fail, we repent. God is faithful to forgive us of our sins if we confess our sins. If, it's a Bible if, we don't hold those sins in, if we, for, if we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's... Praiseworthy. He saved me. And even in my saved state, when I fail the Lord and fall flat on my face, He picks me back up. He forgives me. He saves me from myself, from this wicked body of flesh. When, when you fear God and you do your best to keep His commandments as a saved sinner, that's where true praise of God's going to come from. Thank you, Lord, for what you've given me. Thank you for doing this for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for picking me back up. Thank you for getting this out of my life, this wickedness out of my life. Thank you for getting me on the right path. Through his word, his commandments, fearing God. But they don't want people, like a lot of these false converts out there that like the title Christian, they don't like that. They don't want to fear God, and they don't want to keep his commandments. God's not the final authority. Mankind is the final authority. Ooh, that's their way. But that's not my way because that's not God's way. That's not the Bible way. You're to fear God and you're to keep His commandments. He is the final authority through His perfect written word today, which is the King James Bible. Proverbs 1 7. Proverbs 1 7. You're going to see this all through here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fearing God, keeping His commands and instruction. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. When you have knowledge, you apply it. But I have to point out this verse here. I used to be one of those false converts in these Babel buildings. I wore a short once that said, No... Uh, K-N-O-W, no fear, no God. I'm sorry, N-O, no fear, no God. In other words, they're trying to say, well, fearing God is just knowing God. No, fearing God is fearing God. And if you truly fear God, you will listen to what He has to say. And if you listen to what He has to say, you start to get to knowing God, you'll start to understand how wicked you are. You can start understanding how wrong the world is. The world's way is not the way. The flesh's way is not the way. Satan's way is not the way. That God's way is the way. That's where understanding comes from when you start fearing God. When you fear Him, then you start listening to Him. 
Children, when they have parents, they're supposed to fear their parents when it comes to authority. They try to take that away. No, they're supposed to fear their parents. Why? Because when they get out of line and they don't do what their parents tell them to do, that fear needs to be there to motivate them to do what they're told. But you take the fear away, what happens? Chaos ensues. Chaos, utter chaos. you got disobedient children. When you take the fear of God away, what do you have? Disobedient children. Proverbs 15.33 The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. That there lets us know that in order to fear God, you've got to become humble. You've got to become broken. Okay. Um, I'm reading this in the book, uh, Psalms 51. It talks about uh, Psalms 51, 15. This was my morning read this morning. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice. Because people today believe I just say a little prayer and throw a lot of money at a Babel building or whatever club that I'm a part of, and that will please God. No, it will not. For thou desires not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desires not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. What God wants is you to be broken and humble yourself. Humility. So then you can fear, you'll start fearing God and you'll start listening to Him. That's what he wants. He doesn't want offerings. Then this is talking more like gift offerings. Okay, I believe. He's talking about God doesn't want all these gifts. You can throw in all these gifts at him all you want. He doesn't want that. He wants you. Broken. And before honor is humility. You need to humble yourself. A lot of brethren, I'm telling you, a lot of the brethren that I see that are fallen in these fallen states, all these men of God that I once watched and followed that I see in a fallen state, the one thing, the one, number one thing that they all have in common is what? Their pride. They won't humble themselves. And in their fallen state, they get so prideful, they refuse to allow any brother or sister in Christ through the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit, to help them back up. They refuse God's offer to help them back up into a standing position. Why? Because of their pride. But the fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom. Once again, it goes hand in hand. If you fear God, then you're going to take His Word and you're going to do your best to obey it. Because you're going to fear not obeying God's Word. You're going to fear the repercussions. You're going to fear the punishment. You're going to fear His wrath for the lost world. You're going to fear His chastening for those who are saved. Somebody says, well, that's a lot of Old Testament. I understand that. But in the New Testament, it talks about what true love for God is. We're supposed to fear God, and by default, that's keeping His commandments. That's keeping His Word. It goes hand in hand. If you fear God, then you're going to listen to what He has to say, and you're going to take it here, and you're going to apply it to your life. What about loving God? Jesus, we're going to talk about how loving Jesus is loving God, and what does that mean? Because today you hear this big movement, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. you got all these false converts, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. You have brethren that are in a fallen state that still have that declaration that I love Jesus verbally, but are they showing it physically? Are you showing it, brothers and sisters, Christ, physically? So fearing God by default is you fear Him, you, hear, you heed what He has to say. Not just listen to it, you heed it. You know what it means to heed? You take it and apply it. That's heeding someone's word. Listening, people can listen one ear out the other. But when you heed God's word, it's taking it and obeying it, applying it to your life, obeying it. Okay? John 14, 15. Turn to John 14, 15. This is still Old Testament, but in the New Collection of Books in the New Testament. John 14, 15. Okay? John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. How many times do you hear people say, I love Jesus Christ, I love Jesus Christ. The Bible says, to people who are truly saved, it's made, God has made unto us wisdom. 
Okay, where does wisdom come in? From the fear of the Lord. It leads you to obeying God's word. What's the number one command that God gives today? Obey the gospel. And then after you get saved, there's more commands. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Okay, study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Word to study. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification is going to happen. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You start hiding God's word in your heart. Why? Because love comes in. It starts with fear and ends with love. Then you have to go back to the fear. And it's a cycle. It's a circle. Fear to love. Fear to love. Okay? When you start doing something wrong, the fear needs to be there. You say, Lord, help me get it out of my life. Why do you go to the Lord to help you get it out of your life? Because you love God. God's the only one that can give us the, authority, the, the strength and power to get rid of sin permanently. And that day will come. That day will come. It's not today. We're still under the law of sin and death today. But true love for Jesus Christ is what? Keeping His Word. If a man love me, keep my commandments. In John 14, 21, you go down a few verses, it says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them is he that loveth me. How many times do you come across people that say, I love God, I love God, and you start quoting scripture to them, and they just start getting mad at you. They get start getting bitter and hate and vengeful and mad at you. I always use this as one of my greatest examples. I come across people professing to be saved, sisters in Christ, that say, I love God, I love God. I do easy stuff first, hard stuff last. So let's get the easy stuff. If I come across a man that's professing to be saved, he's got long hair, and I, have, I come across women that profess to be saved, that have short hair and they're wearing pants, I ask them, what are the commands God gives on the appearance of a man or a woman, depending on who I'm talking to? Now, they might be ignorant. They might be newly saved. They might be in a fallen state, and you can pick them back and help them, motivate them, like in meekness, not being sarcastic, not being a jerk, but in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, you sit there and you ask them, what is God's commands on this? What does God say you're supposed, how you're supposed to dress? What does God say how you're supposed to look, how you're supposed to act, how you're supposed to speak? The roles God has for women versus the roles God has for men. Are you staying within those boundaries? That's the easy stuff, honestly. To me, that's the easy stuff. The hard stuff is when the flesh comes in and starts to tell, trying to talk you out of things and to sin. Trying to, the world comes in and tries to make, you know, bully you, guilt trip you bribe you into doing things their way, trying to please God over pleasing men, whether it be a husband, wife, children, neighbors, the world, whatever, okay? But the length of your hair that God says a man's supposed to have short hair, a woman's supposed to have long hair down to her shoulders or longer, that's easy. Why is it so hard? But here's the thing. They can just say, well, that's just your opinion, which it isn't. It's, it's the Bible's word. It's God's commands. But a lot of them get mad. They get hateful. They get vengeful at God's word. How dare you judge me? That's the attitude I get from them. You catch someone getting drinking and getting drunk or getting high. And you say, well, what does God's word say about drunkenness and getting high? You got someone justifying a pagan holiday that's part of worshiping a false god. And you say, well, what does God's word say about that? He that hath my commandments, we have them, and keepeth them is he that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Now before you get upset, oh, you're just pointing the fingers at everybody else. I failed this. Every time that I have given in to temptation and chose to sin, any time that I've given in to the distractions of the world and the temptations of the world and chose to do things that are contrary to what God says I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to do it, it's been my fault. I wasn't showing love for Jesus Christ at that moment. I was showing love for myself. I was showing love for the world. Doesn't the Bible say, love not the world, neither the things in the world? If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're supposed to be able to prove it, what the perfect will of God is. 
That's why the Bible says all scriptures given by inspiration is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect heart, and it's going to reflect by the life that you're living. No, no, we don't prove ourselves. We don't prove ourselves. I come across so many people. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. John 15, 10 says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in His love. What do you do with that? We just ignore it. We just ignore it. True love for God is what? Taking His word and applying it to our life. True fear of God is when we fail to do it. Or we get tempted not to do it. We might not be failing yet, but the temptation comes in from the flesh, from the world, from Satan. Those are the three enemies. The big enemies out there today is your flesh, you, yourself, me, myself, and I, the flesh, the world, and Satan, and his minions. All right? Those are the three enemies. When they come and start trying to talk you out of it, it's that fear that needs to come in saying, I fear God more than I fear them. The flesh the world, Satan. I fear God more, and I'm not going to turn to the left, and I'm not going to turn to the right. That's when the fear comes in. You have love for God, and the fear comes in when you find out, let's say you're studying something, God just showing you the scriptures, and He shows you something that you're doing wrong in your life. What's your first reaction supposed to be? The fear of the Lord. Lord, I'm... I've got this in my life. I had it before. I've had to throw things out in my life. Uh, so there's my cabinet where I collected things from around the world. Uh, I had some things in there that were false gods. And God's like, well, for some reason I was studying something about false gods and I just happened to glance over and God put it in my heart and say, that, is there something wrong with that item? Lord, it's, it's wickedness, Lord. I am so sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. Smash it. Throw it away. It's gone. I'm sorry, Lord. Fear of the Lord. See, they want you to believe it's just all about love and love. You have to have the fear first for the love to come in. Lord, please forgive me. Thank you, Lord. Then the praise. Thank you, Lord, for getting that out of my life. I didn't know. I'm sorry, Lord. Sometimes it's ignorance. You don't know. Sometimes Lord, Lord's like, wait a minute. You let that one thing back into your life that you just gave up, that you gave up for me. <gasps> Lord, I did. I'm doing something that I gave up for you. I know, brother, I told you about this, my hard, it was a hard uh, life trying to get rid of Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, and get porn out of my life, because those are hardcore addictions. Those are hardcore addictions. Some people have drunkenness, some people have uh, substance abuse, uh, drugs, getting high. But you get it out of your life, and then you, it comes back, you let it back in. Then you get it out, and then you let it back in. And it's a struggle for a while until God can get it out. Some people can get it out. God helps them get it out like that. They say, I'm done, and they never touch the stuff again. Some brethren, we struggle with it, and we fight God into giving it up. And God's like, you just let that back in. That's where the fear comes in. Lord, I love your word, and it says that that is wrong. I need to get it out of my life, and you get it back out of your life. That's the attitude of someone who's truly saved. Because we're going to get into this. What are people's attitude to God's perfect written word? Do they fear God and love, and love God's perfect written word? Capital W word and lowercase w word. The written word. Spoken word, written word. What's their attitude towards it? Do they fear God when they're not lining up with this book? Do they have that love for God? They have that heartfelt desire that when they fear God and realize they're not lined up with this book, that they get their life lined up with this book. 1 John 5, 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. See, it goes hand in hand. If you love God, you're going to keep His commandments. If you're not keeping His commandments, you don't love God. It goes hand in hand with the fear. If you fear God, you're going to be keeping, doing your best to keep His commandments. When you fail, you repent, you forsake, and you get back to serving God. But if you're not keeping God's word, by default, you don't fear God. 1 John 5.3 For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. It's not, God's not up there like a, t a t um, dictator 
acting like I'm doing this just to watch the ants scurry. Ha 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 ha. He's doing it to be mean or anything. They're not grievous. He's doing this. He's trying to protect us like a father would a child. He's protecting us. His laws, his commands are protecting us, keeping us on that straight and narrow path. His willing is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He provided a way for us to go to heaven, despite our wickedness and sin. He made a way for us to go to heaven because he loves us. Okay? His commands are not grievous. But the lost world and these fa the false converts that I'm looking with the lost world, they make it grievous. Oh, this is just, this book is just, you know, a guideline. It's not really commands. God doesn't really tell us what to do. We can make our own decisions. We're our own authority. They're acting like this is so grievous. And when you judge people according to God's word, like we're supposed to, he that judgeth, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Lord of God. We're supposed to judge. Prove your own selves. Paul, Paul talks about false converts. In order to warn us about false converts, we have to be able to judge whether someone's true or fake. But they make God's word out to be so grievous. Why? Because they don't want to follow it. That's what, those are marks of someone who's false. If you know someone to be saved, that's the marks of someone who's falling away. When they try to change the Word of God, they try to pervert the Word of God, or they try to ignore the Word of God. When once they would never dare do that because they had the fear of God. They would never dare do that to God's Word. They feared God. And they loved God's Word. But now the love seems to be evaporating away. And then the fear of God evaporates away. And you look at all these brethren that are in a fallen state. And like I said, the number one reason that keeps them in that fallen state is their pride. They won't take correction. They're above accountability. They're beyond corrected, being corrected by any laity. Nobody's. But let's keep going. What's someone's attitude towards the perfect written word of God? And where's the fear of God? Hopefully we've established that. You need to have the fear of God and you need to have a love for God's word. The lost world does not fear God, they do, I mean, just Christ rejecting, does not fear God and do not uh, love God. But you have some false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, they don't fear God and they don't love God. And there's no distinguishing them from the lost world other than their profession of faith and they go to a club every once a week or twice a week. They go to a club called a Babel building, church building, but Babel building. They used to have a profession but their life does not line up with this book. Their life does not line up with what Paul talks about, uh, how you're supposed to live for Jesus Christ and be in Christ Jesus our Lord. Turn to Luke 8.19. Luke 8.19. Luke chapter 8, verse 19. And like I said, my, my biggest thing that I'd hit everybody up, Brian Denlinger, Sam Gipp, um, Chick, uh, David Daniels at Chick Publications, the ex Catholics for Christ. These are the people I used to watch, present tense, and, I can't, uh, and they've gone the way of the world. They're holding to traditions of men, um, church fathers, uh, they're compromising the gospel. They're compromising God's word by adding to it and subtracting from it. They're doing all this stuff that's showing that they, at the present tense, they don't fear God. They don't love God. And I, I challenge them, where's the fear of God? I challenge myself first and foremost, where's the fear of God? Brothers, this is Christ my past. I made some big mistakes. I had to step down from the ministry for a while because I married a lost woman. I told God, I've got this. I know better. Where was the fear of God? I can save her. I can fix her. She has a great profession of faith, but her walk, the, her, there was, her walk of, with the Lord was non-existent. Completely non-existent. She was so worldly. She had so many flesh problems that you say, well, can't a saved person have? Yeah, a someone who's newly saved. But when push came to shove, she didn't fear God. My ex-wife didn't fear God. And she hated God's word. She didn't love God. She didn't fear God. 
And I got myself in that whole mess. It was my fault. Look in the mirror. Every time I look back, like look in the mirror and I look back of what I went through and God saved me from that, I look back and go, where was the fear of God? Where was the love of God? God warned you. God showed you signs. Something wasn't right with her. God showed you signs. And that wasn't the only time. There's other times. Every time in my life, brothers and Christ, that I have fallen flat on my face and I went through the hardest, hardest times in my life as a Christian where it just felt like, Lord, please come call us home now. Please just take me home now. I'm just, I, I've made a mess. I have made a mess of everything. Why? Because I stopped fearing God and I stopped loving God. I started loving myself. I started loving the world. I started fearing God. The, my, my flesh, the world, I started loving the things that Satan was whispering in your ear. And it all, I'm just throwing all those things in there. Whether it's just the flesh that gets you, the world that gets you, or Satan that whispers. All those things can pull you away from God. And when you fail God and you fall flat on your face, it was 100% my fault. 100%. I look back and I ask myself, every time I've fallen flat on my face, every time I've allowed sin back into my life, every time I've done wicked things, where's the fear of God? The flesh talked me out of fear. The world talked me out of fear. Satan starts whispering in your ear, oh, it's not that big of a deal. We always have done it. A little bit don't hurt. We, oh, you know when to quit. You get all these whispers and everything. You're like, where'd those come from? That's not coming from me, Lord. But they talk you out of fear. Where's the fear of God? I ask everybody. It's not just, I'm not just singling all these men out. You ask anybody trying to stand behind the pulpit that adds to God's word, subtracts from God's word, and doesn't hold everyone accountable 100% to God's word. You ask them, where's the fear of God? Where's the love of God? The Trinitarian people trying to push the, Trini the Trinity. Where's the love of God and where's the fear of God? Okay. Pushing pagan holidays that's, uh, that's been proven to be a worship of false gods. Where's the fear of God? People that, that, like, that have no problem adding to and subtracting from the Word of God. Where's the fear of God? Because when you add to and subtract, you're saying, God, you got it wrong. I'll fix it for you. Imagine the pride and the arrogancy you have to get to, the level you have to get to to do that. To add to and subtract from God's Word. To prove, your, to justify your flesh and your wickedness and your sin. Or your, the flesh, the world, you know, traditions of men. Satan's way of doing things. Luke 8, 19 we read, Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. Jesus is among the people, preaching and teaching the people, and here comes Mary, his mother, with his, brothers and, with his brethren. Talking about his brothers. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. She had children after she had Jesus Christ. It's been proven through the scriptures. Okay? But they're coming to him because they want to see him. Verse 20, And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. What's Jesus' response? And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and just speak it. No, 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 that's not what it says. What does it say? Them that fear the word of God and do it. You're not supposed to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. It's not supposed to be all talk. They're supposed to be a walk. And when we tell people to prove themselves, where's the walk? A lot of them get bent out of shape. And when we point out that, like with some brethren, with love, with charity, with love... And meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We point out with some brethren that their walk isn't lining up with their talk. Or their walk isn't lining up with the Word of God. Sometimes it works out. You're, you're able to help a brother back up on his feet. But a lot of times in these last days, the, the, the disease of pride and ego that's going around among the body of Christ, you end up hitting a wall. 
with, the, with a lot of brethren. Hey, you're not lining up with the book. When someone called me out, a lot of times I'm not lining up with the book. Recently, Brother Says Christ, I, I don't know what got in my head, but I was reading something about Paul and Luke. You know, only Luke is with me. And I got into talking about apostles and everything. And I mentioned that, well, Luke was an apostle. I don't know where that came from because it's like Luke's an apostle. For some reason, at that moment, at that time, I was thinking in my head, Luke is an apostle. But I got a correction from a brother in Christ. I said, no, 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 Luke is an apostle. And I flipped over to, I think it's Matthew 10. And I went through all the apostles. And then I started looking around a little bit more just, you know, because I, I don't want to be wrong, but I was wrong. Do you have that attitude sometimes, brother? Like, I can't be wrong. I can't be wrong. Wait a minute. Why did I ever think Luke was an apostle? But I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Okay? And it's like, uh, brothers, if you're wrong, you're wrong. You need to line up with this book. I apologize to that brother. It's like, you're right, I'm wrong. You're right, I'm wrong. Okay? We need to be able to humble ourselves. My mother and my brethren, if they are these which hear the word of God and do it. The word of God is what we're, is our final authority. It's supposed to be. Verbally, you have a lot of people that profess to be Bible believers, but a true Bible believer applies the word of God to their life. Their walk and their talk line up with this book, the King James Bible. And when it doesn't, they are 100% wrong. How do they take being 100% wrong? How did I take it? There's times that I can get all, <laughs> and I spend hours trying to prove that I'm right, but within a couple hours, all God does is show me, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And I spend two hours trying to do a Bible study, trying to prove I'm right, I'm right. And God goes, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And I have to just, I'm sorry, Lord. I, I, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. That's someone who loves the Word of God. Someone who hates the Word of God is going to pervert the Scriptures and change God's Word and everything. I could have perverted the Scriptures and tried to change God's Word to make myself right and Luke to be an apostle. No, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay. I used to say that I used to fall into sin and temptation. And I had a brother in Christ correct me and say, where does it say you can fall into sin? Temptation come along and try to tempt you and you can start giving it more time than it deserves. That's, you're starting to fall into that temptation because you're giving it more time than it deserves. You don't just throw it out immediately. And the next thing you do, you choose to sin. And I got a correction from a brother in Christ on that. That brother in Christ is right. I, I've been saying it wrong. You choose to sin. There is no accident like you tripped and fell into sin. Oops, it was an accident. No. There's sometimes you're ignorant and you're in the middle of sin, like have sinful, wicked things in the house, and God will open your eyes and say, hey, what that is is wrong. Hey, what you're doing there is wrong. You're like, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I Thank you for showing me. I'm getting it out of my life right now. But then there's sometimes where you say something wrong and you know it's wrong and you don't want to give it up, so you try to justify it by manipulating the Word of God. And Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever thou soweth, thou shalt thou also reap. For instruction and righteousness, God is not mocked. You can try to mess with His Word all you want. He's still going to hold you accountable for what you're doing. The wrong that you're doing. The things you're saying that are wrong, the wrong that you're actually physically doing, He's going to hold you accountable to it. People forget there's the judgment seat of Christ and there's the great white throne. Everyone, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We will all be judged one day, period. See, this false easy believing is not that they tell you, oh, you just believe and you're done, and there's no more judgment, and you're free. That's a lie. It's a total lie. We are all going to be judged someday. Everybody has to go through judgment. The difference between me and a lost person is I've got Jesus Christ standing between me and, the, and God Almighty. He's my advocate. He's like, yes, this man is guilty, but I paid for his sins. I paid the price for his sins. That's the difference. But we're still supposed to live a life of Christ today. At the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be losing rewards and gaining rewards. We're going to get rewards and we're going to lose rewards. 
We have the inheritance where we get to come back and rule and reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. You can lose that inheritance down here. The only thing, the only thing that you can't lose is your salvation because it's not yours. God saved you. He purchased you. You belong to God if you're truly saved and born again. And born again, the evidence of salvation. If you're truly saved and born again, that's the only thing you can't lose. You can lose your health. You can lose your life. You can lose your testimony. You can lose rewards. You can lose the inheritance. There's a lot of things you can still lose. And people don't seem to get that. Right? John 14, 23, we read, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. God the Father, when Jesus speaks, God the Father is speaking. Why? Because they are one. Right? Like I said, you get into these people with the Trinitarian paganism, and you say, here's what God's word actually says. I always say, capital, chapter, verse, capital T, Trinity is a title for God. It's not there. Lowercase t, Trinity is a description of God. It's not there. God in three persons. It's not there. God the Son. There is no such thing as God the Son. It's the Son of of God. I know it's hard for some of those Trinitarians. Son of God. That shows connection. Jesus is connected to God the Father. The soul and the body are connected. They are one. When Jesus speaks, God is speaking. When Jesus is doing miracles, it is God doing the miracles. God the Father. They are one. Anyway, I don't want to get into that too much. We have, we're going to have studies here in the future more on the Godhead. But these people, the biggest things about them is they're using things that aren't in the Bible. They're saying things that aren't in the Bible. And you say, okay, show me in the Bible. Only use in the Bible. They can't do it. They always have to add to the scriptures. And, and the thing comes down to, do you fear God? Do you actually love God? Do you actually love Jesus Christ, who is God the Father manifest in the flesh? Do you actually love him? No, they don't. They love themselves. They have no fear. They are the final authorities. God got it wrong, so we have to say Trinity instead of Godhead. God got it wrong. It's not God. The Godhead's not God in the person singular of Jesus Christ. God got it wrong. It's actually God in three persons. It's no longer God the Father, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. God is a Spirit, Spirit, the, the Spirit of God. No, no, it's no longer the Spirit of God. We, God got it wrong. It's God the Father, which is in the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 6. Uh, but there's also a God the Son. See, see God got that wrong. It, it, there, it should be in there. It's not in there, but it should be in there. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. You see how that worked? Chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. Where's the fear of God? Where's the love of God? You can have people talk, 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 and good words and fair speeches, and you look at them and they think, oh man, that man must just really love God. But when you hold their words and their deeds accountable to this book, how much do they really love God? How much do you really love God, brothers and sisters Christ? How much do I love God? How much do I fear God? How much do you fear God? How much do these wicked men out there fear God? These wolves in sheep's clothing. How much do they actually fear God? If they have no problem adding to the Word of God, they don't fear God. And like I said, I know brethren that, that I believe are saved, that are in a fallen state, that they've, in their pride and in their ego, they've added to God's Word and subtracted from God's Word to justify their way of thinking, doing things their way, the world's way, trying to justify their sins, trying to justify their idolatry, their worldliness. I'm not saying they lost their salvation. I don't believe anybody can lose your salvation. But they are in a fallen state. And in that fallen state, until God repents and gets them back up to a standing position, they're not to be taken seriously. What else, where else are they going to be messing up the Word of God to justify their worldliness and sin? Where else? Where else? 1 John 2, 1. My children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin... 
we're supposed to have the attitude of, I don't want to sin. But we also know we're still in this body of wicked flesh. Sometimes we're going to fail the Lord. It's a given. Well, I'm not using it as justification. Well, we're all going to still be sinners, so it's not a big deal. It's still a big deal to me. In my life, I don't want to sin against God. I'm sick and tired of sinning against God. I don't want it in my life anymore. I don't want to. But there are still times where I fail the Lord and I still sin. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. You know what propitiation means? He's ready to forgive. Some people change the definition of words. Propitiation means ready to forgive. It doesn't mean you are forgiven. It means he's ready to forgive. For the lost world, he has not forgiven your sins, period. He didn't pay present tense for your sins, present tense. He took on the suffering and the cost of sin of the world on the cross. What put him on the cross? The sins of the whole world. You want your sins paid for? You want your sins forgiven? You have to go to the cross. But that's not popular today. Today we just tell everybody that God present tense paid for your sins and that God present tense loves you in your lost state. See, that's popular. But the Bible way? Not so popular. We have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous and He is propitiation for our sins. Remember what the Bible says. If... We confess our sins. This is for saved sinners. If we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We go through Jesus Christ as a saved sinner when we fail God and say, Lord, forgive me. Help me get back on the right path. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, that also debunks everything. When they say that Jesus Christ, present tense, paid for your sins. No, he's the propitiation for our sins. He's ready to forgive anybody's sins if they'll come to the cross. Talking about lost people. You've got to come to the cross broken on his terms. Repent. Believe in the finished work. Repent of your sinful, wicked state. And believe in the finished work work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And God will save you. And once God saves you, your heart is for the Lord and God's going to give you a changed life. You're going to say, I love your word. I don't know it yet. And God's going to say, okay, we're going to start pointing out. That's wrong. That's wrong. Okay, you need to be doing this. You're not doing it. You need to be doing this. You need to get that out of you. He's going to start cleaning up your life and there will, guaranteed, if you're truly saved and born again, there will be a changed life. But that's what this is talking about. He's ready to forgive. He's there. He's at the cross. You have to come to the cross. Broken. But people are being taught today, oh, no, 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 no. He's already present tense forgiving your sins. I got into somebody with that once. It's like, if he's already, if he already present tense loves me in my lost state, and he present tense has paid for my sins, what do I need the gospel for? Think about that, brothers and Christ. Why would anybody need the gospel? Why would I need to get saved? It's like uh, you're, you're acting like I'm already saved. I didn't repent. I didn't believe. I didn't confess both in prayer. I didn't ask God to save me. But you're acting like I'm already saved. Everything's been taken care of. What do I need Jesus Christ for again? He, if he already did that, what do I need him for again? You see how that doesn't work out for those of us who are truly saved and born again and we preach the true gospel? We understand that they're still in their sin and they're still going to have to pay for their sin someday if they don't go through Jesus Christ. Here's the key word here, verse 3. And hereby we know that we know Him, Jesus Christ, if we keep His commandments. If we keep his commandments. Remember Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. That we know him if we keep his commandments. If you fear God, you're going to know God by keeping his commandments. Knowing God is not head knowledge. In this context. It's not head knowledge. It's life application. Does your life prove that you know God? Does your life prove that you are of God? Yes or no? 
Like I said, one of the things you can lose as a saved sinner is you can lose your testimony. What's your testimony? Your life showing that you know God, that you love God, that you fear God. The lost world can look at you and they don't see a man that knows God. They don't see a man that fears God. They don't see a man that loves God. They see a man that's just like everyone else. Hey, you're just like me. That's the big push. The battle building that I was in as a false convert, that's what was being pushed. That's what's being pushed, brothers and Christ. Look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, and just say, your, just say a little prayer, have a head belief, and you're good. You can lose your testimony. That's what it means to lose your testimony. I've lost my testimony with my neighbors because of my ex-wife. I've lost my testimony with my uh, immediate family for two reasons. They knew me as a lost man. And as a saved man, I had a lot of struggles with the flesh trying to get things out of my life. So one minute I'm saying this is wrong, and the next minute they caught me doing it. I lost my testimony. But as this Christ, you can lose your testimony. Your testimony, brothers and Christ, is the most important thing you have when it comes to witnessing for Jesus Christ. And when you have a bad testimony and you lose your testimony with people, it, you're going to find that it's next to impossible to lead them to Christ when you've lost your testimony with them. First John 2 4. First John 2 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. All these wolf in sheep's clothing, these people standing behind in battle buildings, uh, standing behind the, the camera and everything. I know God, but are you keeping his commandments? If not, you are a liar. And I've called some brethren out that I believe are saved for lying to us about the scriptures. They manipulate the scriptures, they add to, they subtract from the scriptures because they're trying to justify not keeping his commandments. But this is Christ, if I'm failing the Lord and the flesh, I'm always fearful now because of what I see going on around me with the brethren in ministry. I get very fearful. I get fearful when I see what's going on in the world, how wicked this world is getting. Sodomy is out of control. Feminism is out of control. False gods are out of control. The hate of the one true God and the hate of his word is out of control in this world. I am fearful. I, I, I could easily become part of the falling away. Don't think, brother, sister Christ, for one second, it will never happen to me. Some of the brethren I've had to call out, they said that I never thought it would ever happen to them. They had such a love, a passion for God's Word. They feared God. They loved God's Word. And over time, the world took over. Over time, they kept sacrificing their priorities that God didn't come first here in my life. He did, this, he did here, 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 but here, God didn't come first. And then over here, and then next thing you know, you give up this. Then you give up that and priorities and where God doesn't come first and His Word doesn't come first. And the next thing you know, you see a brother in Christ that's just falling flat on his face. He became part of the falling away. You never thought he would. That's why everything matters, brothers Christ. Even the little stuff. Everything matters when it comes to serving God. Everything matters. You catch someone adding to God's word anywhere. Oh, it's just harmless. Rapture, caught up, it's harmless. It is not harmless. It's paving the way to the falling away. When you start adding to this book and subtracting from this book. Oh, Millennial Kingdom, Day of the Lord, it's not that big of a difference. Yes, it is. It's paving the way for people to start adding to and subtracting from the Word of God. Yea, hath God said. He saith, I know him, and he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Remember, it's not grievous. God's laws aren't grievous. He doesn't give us these commands to hurt us. He gives us this, these commands because he loves us. He knows what's right. He knows what's best. We don't. And this body of flesh is always going to be fighting it. The world's always going to be fighting it. And of course, Satan's always going to be fighting it. 
Verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk. No, 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 it's just talk, it's just talk. No, walk. Even as he walked. 1 Peter 4.17, turn to 1 Peter 4.17. It's not just walk. Jesus was not just all talk. He was talk and walk. He didn't just say things, he lived them. Paul said, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Followers, not talkers of me as I am of Christ, but followers of me. Your walk. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and that first begin at us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? The ultimate command today is what? Obey the gospel. You are bought with a price. Paul gets on to the Corinthians. It's just Romans or Corinthians. He says, you are bought with a price. Know ye not that you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You're to serve God in your words and in your body, in your actions. You belong to God. He commands you obey. When you truly get saved, the true gospel, when you get saved, you belong to God, and God's way is the right way. And we know God's way through His perfect written word. We have a perfect authority, a perfect written word today. You know what? Anybody who denies that, it's because they don't want God as their final authority. They don't want God to be their final authority. They want to be the final authority. When you just come push comes to shove, that's what it comes down to. They don't want a final authority that they're held accountable to. They're all, there is no perfect written word of God. Who's to say what's right and wrong? Remember the scribes? They had no authority. That's how they acted. They didn't, the difference between Jesus and the scribes, why people were listening to Jesus and ignoring the scribes, is because the scribes were like, well, we can't tell what this really means. Here's what I think it means. This is what I feel it means. And, and it could mean this, or it could mean that. Um, a, trans, a better translation would be, or that translation could be translated this way, that way, this way. That. They had no authority. Jesus came to him and said, Thus saith the Lord. He came to him with authority and not as the scribes. And one of his, his number one command today, today, is obey the gospel. And the only way you're gonna, that, that someone's going to get saved today is that they come to God fearing him and broken. Broken because of their, the, the sin and wickedness that they have sown and the consequences of that sin and wickedness. If they don't come to God broken, fearing Him, they'll never get saved. There's not one, I don't care what anybody says, there's not, and I mean this, I care with what God says, and you'd have to show me I'm wrong. Anybody who comes and just says, oh, I, I didn't have to repent, and, and you know, the fear of the, facing the consequences of your sin, fearing God, and acknowledging that you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God, and having sorrow for that sin, oh, I don't have to repent. They're not saved. Period. They're part of a club. They're part of an occult. They're part of a club. And one thing I've noticed, one thing I've really noticed about a lot of these people that don't want to repent and then turn to the cross, like come to the cross in a broken state, in a contrite heart, broken, they bounce around a lot. You ever notice that? In their whole life, I've been going to these Babel buildings for 60 years. Have you gone, been going to the same Babel building for 60 years? Well, no, I didn't like this one over here, so I went to this one. Then they did something I didn't like, and then I went over here. Then they did something, and they bounce around. Now, don't get me wrong. Just because you stay in one Babel building for 60 years doesn't mean you're saved either. But what I've noticed with a lot of people, these buildings, almost every, all these battle buildings have some kind of a split, a church split here, another church split, another church split over time, over time. They never stay as one. They always split. Why? Because they don't have a final authority. They don't. Everyone's their own final authority. And when everyone's their own final authority, they clash and they fight. Okay. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 we read, 
in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. To them that know not God? They don't fear God. The fear of, of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And we talked about it. knowing God is, playing his, is keeping his commandments. If we don't keep his commandments and we claim to know God, we're liars. What's the number one command today? Obey the gospel. You have people out there, there is no repentance, there is no prayer, it's just head belief. They're liars. They don't know God. They're using Bible perversions. They don't know God. They don't know God. What's going to happen to them? Where's the fear? And flaming fire take vengeance on them that know not God. The Bible talks about in Hebrews how God, as a father, would ch chastise us as, he, as a father would a son. God the Father would chastise us as a father would a son. For those of us who are saved, this is what happens to lost people. And flaming fire taking vengeance. We have fear of that. But what happens to our fear of chastisement? How many times have you caught yourself, you, the, the Holy Spirit convicts you, the, your spirit, your conscience, and says, hey, what you're doing is wrong. How many times have you stopped and thought, just stop for a second. When you're in this sin and this wickedness, how you treat a brother in Christ, if you mistreated a brother or sister in Christ, if you mistreated the word, mishandled the word of God, if you're in wickedness and sin, have you ever stopped and go, what things could God do to me to chastise me? What things can God do to punish me? What things can he take away? What things could he, uh, you know, punishment that he could heap on me? Oh Lord, I need to get this out. Help give me the strength to get whatever I'm doing wrong, to stop doing it and get back on the narrow path. Lord, where's the fear of God? There was a time that I corrected, I, professing two brethren, but mainly it was for, directed at one. I corrected him. He was promoting a wicked, vile video game on Facebook. And I confronted him with the scriptures only, not my words. I quoted scripture to him to convict him that what you're posting and what you're indulging in is wickedness and it is sin. And you know what? He came back. Oh, how dare you judge me? You're a liberty thief. You're a liberalist. He came back with hate and anger. Why? He didn't know God. He didn't love God. He didn't fear God. It was all about the flesh. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what are people's reaction when it comes to pushing this? Do you fear God? Prove it. Do you love God? Prove it. Do you know God? Oh yeah, I know God. Prove it. What's their attitude towards that? Does, it line up, does their life line up with this book? Or does their life line up with the flesh? Does their life line up with the world and the world's way? The religious part of the, the wicked world. The false religion of the world. Does their way line up with Satan's way? Romans 10, 16. We read, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Who hath believed our report? 